All right. Hello, class, and welcome to part D of this lecture. So this lecture will hopefully be relatively brief, um, just illustrating some things we can do with the stuff we learned in parts A, B, and C. Uh, specifically, in parts A, B, and C, we learned how to construct the position and velocity vectors based on the orbital elements. Uh, so specifically, uh, to summarize, right, uh, we found our uh, perifocal coordinates uh, and use a sequence of rotations to convert to ECI coordinates. So it's perifocal over here. And we used it to get this uh, relatively straightforward uh, closed form solution for the position and velocity vectors. So after all that, right, we could just sort of write down our answer in closed form, which was, uh, okay, you can do that, right? You know how to know what the equations are, but of course, hopefully, it, we have a little bit more intuition and meaning behind these formula now that we've gone through parts A, B, and C. The goal in this part, however, is to uh, do something uh, interesting with those uh, formulas. So. Particularly, uh, let's suppose we have our position and velocity vectors, and here we'll focus in particular on the position vector. And uh, we want to do something with it. What do we want to do? Well, there's lots of things we could do. Uh, suppose we have a telescope, for example. It's like situated on the Earth, for example. And we want to know, we have this position vector. We calculated it from the orbital elements. Orbital elements we got from, say, um, the astronomical almanac or something like that. And we want to know which way to point our telescope, which means we need to orient a little bit in, in, in space. Um, there the, but there's more applications than just pointing your telescope. For example, if we have a, uh, a, a, a fleet of satellites, for example, and they want to uh, maintain uh, uh, some kind of internet network, not naming names here or anything like that, uh, then uh, they need to know where the uh, neighboring satellites are and where to point their antennae so as to route your data stream to the next satellite and to the next satellite and then down to the Earth to, um, uh, to send your packets where they need to go. So uh, obviously, right, this satellite here needs to know a direction in space uh, to the next satellite that it's communicating with in order to, uh, to send that information, right? And so what, does it what information does it have? Well, it's got its position vectors and it's got the position vector of, say, this other satellite and it needs to know directions, right? Here we're getting sort of into attitude uh, and attitude dynamics and attitude control, which we'll cover in much more depth in lectures 16 and 17. Uh, but uh, we, we can get started with sort of pointing angles now, which doesn't require too much information. Uh, so specifically, uh, you know, uh, we've got these, uh, this, these, these satellites in space, uh, and they have to be able to pick out these reference directions, which we talked about. So for example, the first point of Aries. Very important that you be able to know where the first point of Aries is. Depending on whether you're in the, in the sort of Earth-centered coordinate system, so if we're all around the Earth, which both cases here, they're both around the Earth, so that's, uh, that's the, the case. Um, uh, then we also want to find our z-direction, and in the Earth's case, that's the, uh, the North Celestial Pole, or basically points towards Polaris. Uh, so we have our x at vector, our z-vector, and uh, that's all we need for our coordinate system to orient ourselves in space. So perpendicular to the z-vector, we, of course, have our reference plane. So in the Earth-centered inertial frame, uh, that reference plane is the celestial equator or the equatorial plane of the Earth, right? So um, <clears throat> not, to, not that it actually th goes through the equa e equator, right? Because you could be up here and it'd still be the same plane, uh, but it would be sort of moved. Uh, so it doesn't actually go through the equator necessarily. Uh, but anyway, so you, you have uh, some maybe star tracker or sun tracker or something like that, which allows you to know which angles these are in space. And then you want to be able to point 
orient your, your, your communication array or your telescope with respect to these reference vectors. We need to, those are, those are our navigational aids in space. The, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the landmarks, so to speak, I guess you could call them. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, how do we do this, right? So, oh, now I should also mention, right, they're uh, in the heliocentric coordinate system, right? We might be, uh, say, uh, uh, in a, a sun-synchronous orbit, or no, I mean, sorry, in a, a, a heliocentric orbit, or we might be Voyager 2 over here trying to point our communication array towards the Earth, communicate with, say, the NASA's Deep Space Network, which transmits data to, uh, to NASA. Uh, in any case, you need to know those basic reference directions, although in the heliocentric coordinates, of course, your reference z-axis uh, will not be uh, the rotation vector of the Earth. It would be the angular momentum vector of the solar system or the perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. All right. In any case, uh, assume you have these reference directions, and how do we measure the pointing angles? So these uh, two pointing angles that we're going to define are the right ascension of a right ascension, not right ascension of ascending node, uh, but the right ascension. But clearly, it's like they're related because the right ascension of the ascending node is the right ascension of the ascending node. So uh, they bring it all back together. And declination, so right ascension is measured in the equatorial plane or the reference plane, and declination is up from the reference plane. All right. So let's uh, let's go through and define them real quick. Uh, so now we've got uh, first right ascension. So right ascension is the uh, angle that your position vector makes uh, with the first point of Aries, which is your reference direction. Now here we're initially going to assume that uh, you are located at the center of the Earth, which is, seems unlikely, but we'll correct for that in just a second. So the site you're, you're pointing from is zero, right? So obviously not very realistic, unless of course you're pointing to a planet. And of course astronomers and, uh, and so forth uh, are typically pointing at planets and stars and galaxies and so forth. And so you don't really have to take into account the position of your site in those kind of, of, of applications because the parallax, right, doesn't actually make much difference in those cases. Right, so anyway, um, so we've got our position vector, right? Here, let me draw my arrows more correctly. Uh, we've got our position vector. Actually, I have it drawn in the uh, reference plane, which is not a good idea. So let me just like do a better job. Uh, let's see, here's our, ref our position vector, right, that we're trying to point to. So there's, uh, there's two angles. The first is right ascension. So the right ascension is the angle we measure with respect to the x-axis in that reference plane. So it's, uh, use the right-hand rule, so it's measured clockwise about the rotation vector, the z-axis. And uh, so that's the angle there the right ascension. So how do we calculate the right ascension, right? Well, uh, really quite simple, actually. Uh, so we just project this position vector onto the equatorial plane We can find this point. So that point is just the position vector without the Z part, right? So if we break this position vector into, say, R, X, R, Y, and R, Z components, right? We just drop off the Z component to get this point, right? This is rx, ry, and 0. Here I use r1 and r2 so on the notes. All right, so to measure that angle, right, uh, that gives us, the, that angle gives us the uh, x coordinates, right, rx, and uh, perpendicular to that in the y direction. Well, I haven't drawn it very well, but uh, say perpendicular to that. All right. That is the ry. And so obviously this angle, right, is the, um, uh, can, you, you get that from the opposite over adjacent, right? So opposite over adjacent is r2 over r1 or ry over rx. And uh, of course, uh, that's the, that gives us our tangent, 
right? So tangent of alpha is r2 over r1 or ry over rx. And so, of course, to find uh, solve for that, we just uh, use arctangent of, uh, let's say, ry over rx. And uh, of course here, right, the right ascension can be between zero and 360. So you do have to make sure you're in the white quadrant. So there's that. Now let's uh, briefly address the quest, the problem that uh, we are not located at the center of the earth. And this is of course important when you're pointing at satellites or things that are nearby, not uh, uh, so that the radius of the earth is actually non-trivial, distance, relative. And in this case, we have to find our relative position vector. Right? So this is what we're pointing at, and this is where we are. So our relative position, we have to subtract off our actual position in ECI coordinates uh, to get our relative position vector. <clears throat> so both of these are in ECI. Right? And uh, of course, how do we calculate uh, our actual position? Right. So of course, if we're in orbit uh, around the Earth, we can just use our orbital elements using parts A, B, and C of this lecture. Um, if we're not in orbit, however, it's, uh, it's actually a little bit more complicated. Well, I mean, I guess not more complicated, but it's a different formula which we haven't gone over yet. Um, <clears throat> in that case, uh, we have to uh, go back and talk a little bit about uh, the ECI, ECEF coordinate system. Uh, so basically, your position vector in ECF is fixed by your geography, where you are. In ECI, however, of course, the Earth is rotating, and so that rotation of the Earth, we have to correct for that. So first step, right, per, perhaps, uh, or you can use this formula to convert directly, uh, is, to, uh, is to calculate our ECEF coordinates. So actually that's not too bad, right? So that's just uh, two rotations. So basically it uh, starts you off in the X direction here, so assuming uh, RE, that's the radius of the Earth, zero, zero. And then it's uh, just a matter of two rotations. Uh, the f this is actually latitude, if I spelled latitude right. Well, I didn't include an E, so I guess I didn't spell it right. Um, <clears throat> so two rotations. The first is up, right? So that's about the Y axis. So this is, remember, X. And this is Y, so it's a rotation. It's a little bit confusing, actually, because uh, uh, remember, a rotation around the Y is, uh, is, 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 is obeys the right-hand rule. So actually, positive rotation around the Y is down, uh, and our latitude is uh, usually measured up. But the R2 rotation matrix is a negative angle, and so those negatives cancel out, so the rotations end up being positive here. That's why there's no negative sign here. Right. So anyway, we measure to up is north latitude, right? Latitude um, north. <clears throat> so that's our, our first rotation here. We measure uh, R2 up to north latitude. Uh, and then, of course, we rotate about the uh, z-axis uh, to get our longitude. So we uh, measure that direction. Remember, again, right-hand rule. So east is a positive rotation. So uh, this is longitude. And positive direction is east. So for example, here in Phoenix, we're at uh, uh, 33 degrees or something like that. Oh wait, I forget what our longitude is. It's, no, it's like 115 degrees or something like that, west. So actually, we our angle would be negative 115 degrees or whatever it is. Uh, so anyway, just uh, keep that in mind. And then uh, your position vector in ECF coordinate systems is, uh, is this, this thing right here. So relatively constant. Now to get, uh, there's another rotation, of course, to get to ECI from ECEF. Now this rotation is actually quite complicated if you're an astronomer and have to be very accurate. 
uh, because there's the nutation of the earth and all these like com computations. And very often, uh, you know, no one cares about ECI coordinates because, you know, you want to know where to point your dish or whatever. And so usually, very often, you're looking to convert to ECF, and it's very complicated, and I won't go through it, except to a first approximation, which is based on the earth rotation angle, or it's now called earth rotation angle. They seem to change it quite often. Uh, but in any case, it's uh, in the olden days, it was uh, local sidereal time. And quite honestly, most people still use local sidereal time if they're not being very accurate. But just keep in mind, if you want to sound sophisticated and cool, you can use earth rotation angle as well. Uh, but anyway, we use local sidereal time. Uh, and that measures, of course, um, the basically, so here's uh, zero degrees uh, lat longitude which is Greenwich. And it measures basically the rotation angle from the first point of Aries to Greenwich. So Earth rotation angle. And then it adds your longitude to that to get local sidereal time. So uh, yeah, Greenwich mean time, sorry, Greenwich mean time is the equivalent of the Earth rotation angle. Uh, so, okay. Uh, actually, it's not Greenwich Mean Time. It's called, um, I don't know, UTC or something like that. It has a Greenwich Sidereal Time, I think, is what it's called. Uh, in any case, uh, theta LST is uh, that uh, Greenwich Sidereal Time uh, plus uh, your longitude, so basically. Two rotations. So instead of just rotating... Uh, by your longitude, you rotate the longitude plus Greenwich sidereal time. That's basically it. So that, if you're on the Earth, that gives you your position vector in ECI coordinates. So it's a very long-winded way of saying uh, how to correct for this relative position vector uh, by calculating your position vector on the Earth. Obviously, if you're a satellite in orbit, uh, you can just use the stuff from lectures. So lecture 7, one, A, B, and C. Uh, so anyway, um, let's see. On the previous slide, we have a formula for right ascension. Our y over Rx. And now next, uh, so this, that's uh, right ascension, alpha. And now we want to measure the next angle, which is the angle up. Uh, pointing angle up from the reference plane. So that's delta. Right. So, okay, how are we going to calculate this? So let's, uh, let's drop uh, to, to measure this angle. That's, this is declination. Uh, D, delta for declination. Greeks must have invented it. They didn't. But we like Greeks, so we use their, their alphabet quite a bit. Uh, in any case, uh, so what are we gonna? What, what are the uh, lengths we have here? So the vertical uh, distance is, of course, R Z above the reference plane, and uh, well, there's two other lengths here. So this one's the easiest, right? It's just the radius, right? The distance, total, the magnitude of the position vector. Alternatively, we could use this length, which is just the position vector projected onto the xy plane, which is, of course, rx squared plus ry squared square root. Um, so either formula works. In fact, for a declination, you don't need to go. It's, it's plus or minus uh, 90 degrees, so we don't really have to worry about quadrant ambiguity too much. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have two formula we can use uh, depending on which we prefer. Uh, the first is uh, is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So R3 or Rz over length. And the second is uh, opposite over adjacent. We're using these two lengths here. And that's uh, Rz over square root of Rx squared plus Ry squared. And of course, we do the inverse tangent or inverse so, uh, sine to get our actual angle. So formulas for declination and formula for right ascension. In both cases, of course, if we're observing something local, we need to subtract off the ECI coordinates of our observation site. 
All right, so uh, there we go. That's uh, right ascension and declination. That's how to point to where we want to point to. Um, assuming, of course, you can orient yourself sufficiently in the sky. So for a satellite, obviously, you, know, you got to use a star tracker to figure out where this, uh, this, uh, uh, this x direction is and what the, where the reference plane is in order to, to point these angles. On the surface of the Earth, however, it's a, it's a little bit easier in a way uh, because we can orient ourselves just by local topocentric horizon coordinates, like where is south using a compass and then just the horizon of the, of the surface of the Earth, assuming you, it, you're not in a too hilly a location. So to illustrate that, um, I will just talk about the, that topocentric horizon coordinate system a little bit, briefly, right? how to point your telescope, aka. Uh, so basically, how to orient on the surface of the Earth. So if we're like drawing our Earth here, Right here we are, northern hemisphere. Yeah, very northern hemisphere centric here. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, we have uh, some pretty easy reference coordinates. So, for example, we can we know which way is up, right? It's that way. You know, use a plumb line, right? Very old technology. There's a plumb line that's pointing down. There's my negative z direction. Um, also, we can figure out which way is south, right? In the topocentric horizon, because we have a compass. Well, I have a compass on my phone. Hey, Siri, open compass. Thank you, Siri. So south is um, pointing oh, almost directly towards me. Nice. So uh, now that Siri has uh, given me two, one reference direction and my plumb line is giving you another reference direction, I can uh, orient, just transfer those reference directions to the more convenient or more important uh, Equator uh, reference plane and z direction. So first of all, right? Uh, let's figure out uh, the uh, the um, where the uh, that reference plane is, right? So the reference plane, remember, equator. So a couple of points, right? So first of all, uh, if you're on the North Pole, right? Reference plane is uh, due south, right? There it is. It's just the horizon if you're at the North Pole. If you're at the uh, equator, equator, right? Reference plane is straight up. I'm not at the equator, so, but if I was there, it would be straight up. Uh, if you're in between, you can just calculate it based on some geometry. So specifically, presumably, you know what your latitude is. So that's the angle that a do up makes with the equator. So that's phi, if you denote it correctly. Uh, so that's phi. Uh, so then where is your reference plane? Well, it's um, 90 degrees from due up, right? So this that's 90 degrees there. Make, introduce some new colors there. 90 degrees from due up. Uh, so where is that? Uh, so we're looking for this angle right here. So how far is it up from due south? Right. So if we, uh, let's see, just continue these angles here, right? So... Uh, we want this angle right there. So let's we just like look at similar triangles. Uh, so this is phi, and so this angle is 90 minus phi. Right. So uh, there we go. The uh, equatorial plane, the reference plane that we're looking for, is 90 degrees minus phi, or your latitude, up from due south. So you uh, take your compass, which is that way, points due south. Then you go up about, let's see, we're at, uh, I think, 33 degrees uh, latitude, north latitude. So we, I would have to point up about, um, I don't know, what was it, uh, 50, 55 degrees up in order to get that uh, celestial equator. So for me, in Phoenix, it's about 55 degrees. All right, go up. So that's, uh, that lets you locate your celestial equator. Uh, that's the easy part, sadly. Uh, the harder part is locating the first point of Aries, right? Which is a point in that celestial equator. Where is the first point of Aries? Uh, 
where is our x direction? Because that's, remember, we if once we have, uh, so declination is easy. We could just measure up from the celestial equator. But right ascension is measured as from that first point of Aries, right? And so we have to figure out what angle we're measuring from due south. Uh, be, but in order to figure that out, we need to know what this angle is. And it turns out that that angle is local sidereal time. Oh, uh, I am at 33.45 degrees north latitude, by the way. Um, all right, so declination, as I mentioned, uh, once you have that, uh, uh, that uh, celestial reference plane, uh, is just measures up and down angle from that. So that's your declination down, if your declination is negative, or if your declination is up, you measure up from that referencing. So that's positive declination and negative declination, right? So northern or summerly from zero degrees, your reference plane. Incidentally, I should just mention that, you know, again, there are a million YouTube videos or whatever on this topic of astronomy because astronomy for some reason is very popular. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm don't, not trying to replicate any of that material, but because, right, it sort of feeds into what we've been talking about in parts A, B, and C, that's why we're covering it. Uh, maybe it's even easier to comprehend once we've comprehended parts A, B, and C. But anyway, I'll just continue with my replication. Right. So uh, again, right, we've got uh, the first point of Aries over here, which is our, we're measuring our reference, our right ascension from. And now we've got to figure out, right, uh, what this angle here is. Right? So this uh, this angle from first point of Aries to due south. So, right, if you think about it, right, here's uh, the plane, here's you on the Earth, right, there's due south, uh, and there's uh, there maybe the first point of Aries over here. And so due south is pointing outwards from the equator. Here, I guess, uh, here you are, right, on north latitudes, right? So there's due south, right? There's the first point of Aries, right? And uh, your due south, of course, is rotating with time, right? So as the Earth rotates, uh, your due south is, uh, is changing. Uh, the first point of Aries, of course, that's the whole point, is not changing. And uh, so... To calculate this uh, this angle, right, we have to know what time it is, right? So let's see, here I'll draw like, maybe not on the picture up here, but let's say we have our right ascension to our position vector, alpha, and we want to figure out what direction from due south that uh, we were trying to measure, right? So let's call this alpha relative. So obviously to, to calculate it's relatively easy, right? It's just uh, the right ascension minus this angle. So what is that angle? That angle is time, that, uh, particularly local sidereal time. Uh, so what is local sidereal time? Let me draw another set of circles. Um, if I have the space, here's my circles again. Uh, here is, uh, here's, first point of Aries, here is uh, due south, ds for due south, and let's say uh, that's, uh, that's, um, that's uh, where I'm in Phoenix, uh, and here we've got uh, Greenwich, England, zero degrees, Greenwich. Right. So how do I calculate, the question is how do I calculate this angle? Right, so what I do is I, well, I of course could just open up my iPhone and use one of the three apps, all of which I have on my iPhone. Actually, I have Sky Safari Pro, because I'm a total pro. Uh, first is the aptly named Local Sidereal Time, which is honestly what I use most often. Uh, there's also LST Clock, which has a, has a actually uh, has a, an iWatch interface, so you can, like, it has actually an iWatch uh, face. I don't use it, but. 
Uh, anyway, so you could just like bring that up and it would calculate it for you. But of course you could do all of this with Sky Safari. It would tell you exactly where everything is. But anyway, uh, let's not do that. So the first step is to figure out uh, what time it is in Greenwich or what this angle is in Greenwich. Uh, so that angle is uh, Greenwich sidereal time. And for that, you uh, you do pretty much need a uh, a calculator or so something, a, a table or a converter from time to Greenwich sidereal time, right? Because it's uh, the calculations there are relatively complex, and time, my goodness, astronomers take very good ca care of time, much more so than I do. I always make sort of all sorts of ridiculous assumptions. But anyway, that's Greenwich sidereal time, and then uh, to measure your um, local sidereal time, you take Greenwich sidereal time and you add your uh, your uh, longitude to that. So in particular, you measure your longitude uh, east right, from Greenwich. Now me, I'm at, uh, my longitude is 35 degrees, uh, sorry, 115 degrees west approximately. I think it's on one of these slides, but... Um, so if you're if you're go, if you're west, your land, longitude is west. Actually, uh, it's measures that way. So actually, your angle is negative, but that's okay. But let's just assume that we're to the east. So you just add Greenwich sidereal time to your la longitude, and that gives you your local sidereal time. And if we look at this, uh, if we look at this, uh, right, um, this uh, this little plot here, right, it, you know, the astronomers they they actually like right are measuring uh, these angles in time by themselves, right? They don't even bother to convert to uh, actual angles, right? So this is uh, this is uh, I guess that's the first point of Aries right there. So actually, I should write that as the first point of Aries. Um, anyway, as, as I was saying, right, Greenwich sidereal time to local sidereal time, you add your longitude. Um, Greenwich sidereal time is uh, on your most calculators. Let me just uh, bring one up. Let's see. Uh, this, uh, yeah, that's local sidereal time. Local sidereal time here is 13.46.40. Um, I have another one, LST clock, right, which gives us uh, all these times. So. Uh, Greenwich time is currently 21 hours, 14 minutes. Uh, local time is uh, 5 hours, 18 minutes. And my local sidereal time is 13 hours, 47 minutes. So three different times going on here. Um, yeah. So now armed with your local sidereal time, you can, of course, uh, locate your uh, relative, right? Uh, alpha relative um, angle, which is the right ascension minus theta, oops, wrong, theta LST. So that from due south, you measure along your reference plane by theta alpha relative, and then you measure up along the straight up from that point uh, by your declination. And that gives you your pointing position. So that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover. I'm gonna do an example, but before I do that, I'll just like, again, take some videos I like pulled off the internet uh, showing the uh, migration of time, right? Um, let's see, where is this person located? Over time, we see this, uh, the sky is moving like that and there's like our zero angles moving over here. See what else I've got here. Oh, uh, we got to these uh, orientation videos. Um, yeah. So here's the, you see the clock there and it's moving with time. And then the, uh, the there's the North Pole. Uh, that's Polaris. You measure down to that. That gives you 90 degrees to gives you your reference plane. And so there's our reference plane. So the celestial equator, there's a sun above that. 
sun moves in the ecliptic. There it's uh, going down. There going up. It's about to hit the first point of Aries. There's the first point of Aries and completes the ecliptic. So our time gives us that first point of Aries. Right? And then we measure our right ascension to the, uh, the object based on that point. And then we measure down from the celestial equator by the amount equal to the declination. Or uh, if the declination is positive, we will measure up, of course. Uh, let's see, I've got uh, one more little video here. I'm not sure it's particularly enlightening. There are much better videos uh, on YouTube now, I, I, but I, I didn't feel like pulling them off. Um, so here's, a, here's another one. I'm not there, by the way. That looked like it was in the middle of nowhere. Maybe uh, uh, Ohio? I don't know. Where is that? Anyway, so here's, the, uh, here's the, that grid, right? Here are those astronomers using time to, instead of angles on their grid. Let's see, where's the uh, first point of Aries? Boom, there it is. First point of Aries. They're measuring declination up, declination down. Now we're gonna, let's see, what are we gonna do? I guess we're pointing, we're gonna point to the red star. Right, there's our reference plane, that's our equatorial plane. Right. So uh, we measure, uh, there's a topocentric horizon coordinates. We have our X direction pointing straight up. Uh, that uh, equator, the uh, celestial equator, and of course the uh, time is, is invariant. And so here you see the, uh, uh, the l due south, right, pointing down here for this person. Right, and there's uh, now our local horizon coordinate systems. They've located their reference plane. They're watching it go, and they're figuring out where the declinate, the right ascension is at various points. Straight east, it looks like. Now they're looking due south, right? So uh, the reference plate isn't even in view there, right? They have to look pretty far to the north to find that reference plane. And uh, there's the nor due north. I guess you can measure from due north as well, if you'd like, to get to the reference plane. So again, right, you're finding your uh, right ascension going along this line from due south. I think the due south video, where is that due south? Yeah. So uh, find your reference plane. It's way up here. And then measure along the reference plane. All right, so finally, let's like uh, take a uh, an engineering or a Starlink example. Actually, it's very violent because like, I don't know, um, is violence fun? Violence is not fun. We should not be glorifying violence at all. But our, our example is, uh, suppose we have our laser cannon in space and we want to destroy uh, some defense satellite or a ballistic missile or what have you. And uh, we need to know where to point our laser cannon. All right. Notice that we'll do the same thing when we get to Lambert's problem, but we'll have to compute orbits because uh, missiles don't fly at the you know um, speed of light. So in any case, uh, we have our uh, our uh, laser cannon platform. It's in orbit. It's not a very good orbit. Uh, it's uh, pretty high up though, uh, nine Earth radii, a semi-major axis, but very eccentric. So it's going to actually get quite close to the Earth's surface there. And we want to, we have a target uh, given to us by someone or other, and we want to, uh, to blow it up uh, or just spy on it. I don't know. Maybe we don't want to blow it up. But uh, here it says blow it up, so I guess we're going to blow it up. So anyway, it's, uh, we have orbital elements for both of these. We have the orbital elements, and we have the true anomaly in particular. This is the only one that varies with time at an instant in time. So based on those two sets of orbital elements, we want to determine the right ascension, which are the tar and declination, which are the targeting angles, assuming we can orient in space with star trackers or whatever to give us our X hat and Z hat directions. Uh, so, okay, how are we gonna compute that? Well, first of all, of course, we want to transfer both of these sets of or orbital elements to position vectors. We don't have to worry about velocity vectors because it doesn't factor in. So uh, I just used the, the, the calculator or that actually closed form formula on the previous slide, uh, that MATLAB script, in fact, uh, to calculate the position vectors. Here I've used uh, uh, canonical units uh, for the position vector. So we're pretty high up, pretty safe. Can probably hit almost anything. 
the position vector for our target, however, much closer to the Earth, so hopefully we'll hit it without blowing up something on the Earth. Uh, very close to the surface of the Earth there. Um, very close to one Earth radii. But it's not, I mean, it's a, the square root of 3 is like one, uh, one point, 1 point 1.7, 1 point 1.8, something like that. So its distance above the Earth is substantial. It's not too close to the Earth. In any case, first step, calculate our relative position vector. Uh, that's our position vector. Uh, sorry, our target position vector minus our position vector. Both of these, of course, are in ECI. So that gives us our relative position vector. Next step, compute uh, right ascension and declination. Right ascension, right? Uh, which formula are we using for right ascension? So uh, inverse tan of ry over rx, so that's y. Uh, declination, uh, I guess we're using inverse tangent again, of rz over square root of rx squared plus ry squared. That gives us uh, two angles. Uh, first, uh, declination uh, positive, one, point, one radian, so that's pretty high up. And right ascension of negative 2.217 uh, radians. So uh, this is our first point of Aries. Uh, right ascension is going to give us uh, about here-ish. And declination uh, is going to be up by fairly high number. Yeah, sorry, it's messing. Let me redraw that. So again, right, this is measured from your satellite. So your satellite, uh, your orbiting space platform, right, knows where the x hat axis is and uh, knows where the reference plane is as measured perpendicular to the z-axis. And so that's our alpha. And then, so this, my 3D ability is bad here. That's our declination. So there's our angles. We point our space laser. We blow up the ballistic missile and save whatever it was pointed at. Or maybe it's a defense satellite, and then we do whatever, start a war in space. Not a good idea, generally speaking. Uh, in any case, uh, right, uh, don't forget, uh, if you're on the surface of the Earth, to calculate your LST for this. Um, and in space, use star trackers. So to conclude, now we've uh, finished the first part of this course uh, where we've been able to convert between orbital elements where we've defined them all uh, and position and, vec and velocity vectors. So we can go back and forth of the, those directions. Uh, the hard direction requires us to solve Kepler's equation and the easy direction does not. The easier direction, by the way, is this one because it's just a closed form solution. Um, However, uh, we also be able to propagate the orbit in time to uh, get our, uh, our true anomaly at time t2, which then allows us to recompute our position and velocity vectors at that future point in time. Next, uh, next part of the course, uh, just a plug for part B, uh, part two of the course, uh, is not just astronomy, not just determining position and velocity vectors, but maneuvering, so how to or if, if you're playing Kerbal Space Program or whatever, how to uh, design your orbits or your delta Vs in particular. So to get from one orbit to another. Uh, so for example, if you've got a launch a spacecraft into a parking orbit, and then we have a transfer orbit to, to geo, uh, and then we inject into geo, for example. All right, three different orbits, and at each transition we have a delta V. Uh, actually, maybe there's delta V here. There we go. Uh, and so the, the next part of the, of the course is how to calculate these delta Vs, not just for home and transfers, which is the easiest case, and we'll cover it, of course, force, but we'll also talk about Lambert's problem and how to ca calculate general transfer orbits given constraints on time and so on and so forth. But we will leave that for the part two of the course. And in the meantime, uh, I hope you've enjoyed part one. Uh, see you around.